We came pretty close to having two brand new teams atop this week's AP Top 25. It didn't happen, but there were some other notable teams that took a tumble this weekend. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? Welcome into Locked On College Basketball, a five-day-a-week national college basketball show. We are your co-hosts, Andy Patton, and I'm Isaac Shade. And today's episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by Sling TV. Do not miss tomorrow's Champions Classic with games between Kentucky and Michigan State and then Kansas Duke in the nightcap on ESPN right here on Sling. Sling, the TV you love for the price you love. Try it today. And so, Andy, man, we had uh, some close calls Friday night. We almost Mm. saw number one and number two lose, like, simultaneously, essentially, um, with – Gonzaga playing on an aircraft carrier against Michigan State and North Carolina, the number one team in the country, hosting College of Charleston at home in the Dean Smith Center. Why don't we start with Gonzaga, the more high profile game, uh, all these cool moments on this Veteran Day, Veterans mm-hmm. Day weekend out on the aircraft carrier. Yeah, you know, it was it was a a great environment, a cool setting. There was so much kind of concern coming into the game about like, is this going to work? Are we going to have another halftime cancellation? Oh, man. Uh, Right before the game, the the big concern was the sun, which was in a horrific spot for Michigan State's players uh, in the first half. Fortunately, it kind of ended up going behind uh, either some clouds or something and didn't end up causing a significant problem. Uh, So the setting was beautiful. The game was the, the kind of game that we have come to come to uh, expect uh, when they're played in these environments. There was very little outside shooting. Uh, it was a low scoring game, 64, 63, but my goodness, the Zags really didn't look much like the number two team in the country for the first half of the game. Uh, the first, even more than half the, first, the start of the second half, they were really struggling too, but then they put everybody on the back of Drew Timmy. They let him take control. He was responsible for the team's final 18 points and they pulled out a victory. It's one of those games that I think you could, anybody could have watched this game, watched every single minute of it and be, you know, equal intelligence as basketball fans and still come away with entirely different representations of Gonzaga. Some people say, Hey, this is proof that this team's soft. This is proof that they're not as deep, that their guard play is, is challenging. They don't have the rim protection, et cetera, et cetera. All these concerns that many people had about Gonzaga coming into the season. And many of them showed up in very significant ways throughout the game. But at the end of the day, they got punched in the mouth in the first half. They punched back in the second half. They, outmatched Michigan State down low. The physicality from Drew Timmy and other players on the team really, really stood out out in a big way. And they came from behind and won. So to me, like looking at Gonzaga and and yeah, you can see the the fact that they are a flawed team and that those flaws are, have not been resolved, but we're also, it's November 13th as we're (laughs) recording this. So you wouldn't expect the team's flaws to have completely dissipated by now, but instead we saw a team that, despite those flaws, managed to find ways to make adjustments, to make coaching changes, decisions that, you know, it's really tough to coach against Tom Izzo. Mark really? Few found a way to make some adjustments, entirely go away from their ball screen option and the ball screen offense in the second half. Just abandon it, something that has yeah. been a part of Gonzaga's offense for decades. It's something that they have run. Andrew Nembhard ran it seamlessly all of the time last year. And now they have a young point guard, Nolan Hickman. He didn't play the final 12 minutes of this game. Gonzaga ran out shooting guard Hunter Salas, who hasn't been a point guard in his college career, didn't really come to Gonzaga to be a point guard. They ran him out there because he offers them more defense. He just came down the court and they basically just did entry passes to Drew Timmy. There was no offense, no creativity. Just get the ball to Drew, get out of his way, let him operate. And look at that. They got themselves a victory. Yeah, and I mean, this is what you want to see. It's college basketball. You make it to the national championship game. You're playing 39, 40 games. You're going to have Mm -hmm. games like this, particularly in your first game against top flight competition in the season, particularly on an aircraft carrier (laughs) where Tom Izzo has played before. Yes, exactly. They've done this. He was in the inaugural game against North Carolina in like the 2010-11 season, I believe Mm -hmm. was the first one. Um, and, and so Andy, my question to you is, is the closeness, is this result more mm-hmm. about Michigan state? Mm-hmm. Is it more about Gonzaga or is it more about the environment or some sort of combination of those three? 
I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a combination. I think it has a lot to do with the aircraft carrier, to be honest. I think Michigan State, having having been in this experience before, Tom Izzo kind of knowing how to coach to this experience, I think helped. You saw Gonzaga in the first half trying as much as they can to just run their normal offense. And their normal offense is set up in a way to give players the option to look down low or take outside shots. Well, Michigan State just packed the paint and Gonzaga took what was given to them in the offense, which is how they've been taught, how they've been coached to do. And they were taking open threes and they just, I I think they had four threes that hit nothing but backboard. That's just how this game kind of operates. And so I think Gonzaga had to adjust to that and they did give them credit because they earned it. But I think that the result in general, I think Michigan state's probably a little better than people thought Gonzaga's maybe more of a, four or five team than a top three team. But you know, the, the difference between one and five right now is pretty small. So I think that that's kind of a negligible difference. Uh, And beyond that, I think it shows that these games are really, really hard and the results are going to be really, really wonky, regardless of the fact that, you know, this one didn't end at halftime, like some of them have, but at the end of the day, it's still a result that I think you got to take with pretty significant grain of salt. Yeah. And, and while this isn't a, uh, one of the historically great Tom Izzo, Michigan state teams, Mm -hmm. This is a top 30 team, right? Let, right? Let's not pretend there's some nobodies. Mm-hmm. They're going to come out. It's it's Tom Izzo. They're going to play. Yep. Well, let's let's flip to the other side and look at North Carolina's game against Charleston. And it's funny. It's almost a mirror of what happened in the 2021-22 season. North Carolina played Charleston in the third game of the year. They were down by six at halftime, down by seven at halftime in this one. It's just kind of this relentless team from coach Pat Kelsey, who's basically like, I need six charges a game from you guys, (laughs) that kind of game up and down chucking threes, but man, North Carolina comes out uh, for in the second half and just basically blitzes college of Charleston outscoring them 59 to 36 in the second half. Um, And listen, this was the Caleb love and Armando Baycott show. At halftime, Armando Baycott had one point and one rebound. This is your double-double king, basically. He finishes the game with 28 points and six rebounds. So we got a 27-point second half from Armando Baycott. Caleb Love finishes with 25 points. The two of them combined to score Carolina's first 19 points of the second half. And so uh, you love to see that from them. Uh, interestingly, a lot of people often forget about Leaky Black being one of the best defenders in the country. This guy comes out and holds Rain Smith, who is College of Charleston's infinitely best scorer, had 19 points against Carolina last year, 24 points in Charleston's opening game of the season. Leaky Black holds him to three points, made wow. one three-pointer on, I don't even remember his shooting totals. Let me look back at it on, on just four shot attempts. That's Mm -hmm. all this dude is getting. And so um, that's the nice thing for the Tar Heels is this is a more defensively capable team than you're used to seeing out of Chapel Hill, Um, which also includes true freshman Seth Trimble, who is a ball hawk. Uh, Like it is just fun to watch for the Tar Heels. And so it's one, I think this is the the closeness of it, at least in the first half is a function of the team you're playing and those early season jitters and those, Hey, you're not used to having this target on your back. Despite what North Carolina did last season in the latter third, they never were the team with the target on their back. They were always the hunter, not the hunted. Mm -hmm. And so they're learning how to do what Gonzaga has been trying to do for the past couple decades now, basically. So uh, I would say better days are ahead for the Tar Heels. I'm not um, off of anything that anyone thought about them preseason as of yet. Um, But you want to see what happens. They've got Gardner Webb this uh, tomorrow on Tuesday and then play James Madison next Sunday. So I believe those two games should be telling of can Carolina kind of collect who they are and keep rolling from there. Well, in addition to these games that were almost upsets, as we said, there were some actual very upset upsets this weekend and other games of note. What were they? We'll get you up to speed on those in just a moment. But first, this episode is brought to you by Upside. Inflation has us all thinking about different ways to cut back. Whether it's driving less, dining out less, or buying less from the grocery store, we can all agree there's nothing fun about less. So that's why I started using Upside. I do it every time I go to the gas pump, and it has 
helped me, which is why I haven't had to cut back as much because upside, I use it literally every time I get gas. So now I've been able to keep getting those chestnut praline lattes that I love from Starbucks. Seriously, folks, if you've never had one, man, chef's kiss because of the extra cash in my pocket. To get started, download the free Upside app, use my promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $5 of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with the credit card or debit card and then get paid. In comparison to other credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn 3 times more cash back with Upside. So, download the free Upside app, Upside app right now and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Again, that's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code LOCKED. Well, Andy, we saw several um, high profile, at least one or two of what I thought are preseason top 10 teams mm -hmm. in my book, Villanova loses on Friday night. Oregon loses on Friday night. Tennessee looked flat out ugly on Sunday afternoon <laughs> against Colorado. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to talk about those. But first, let me remind you for your second listen of the day to check out Locked On Sports today. From the games that matter most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only we at Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports today. Available on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. So, Andy, before we start looking at those three upsets, let me just walk us through a couple other notable games of the weekend. Just a little quick run around, a quick flyby, and then I'll let you take it where you want to go first with these three games. First off, uh, we had a fun on Saturday, a fun little uh, what I'll call the Shaheen Holloway Classic. Uh, um, Seton Hall, who he now coaches, his alma mater, playing the team he took to the Elite Eight last year, St. Peter's, uh, knocking off. Uh, Seton Hall wins this game 80 to 44. Not really much of a game, but it's just a cool thing to see there. Um, a, another storyline some struggling ACC teams. Louisville and Florida State are both now 0 and 2. Yikes, their better days are probably ahead for FSU, not so much for Louisville. They are just plain terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a South Carolina SEC ACC game. You love to see those. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny in football, it's late season, basketball, usually early season. South Carolina actually beats. Clemson 60 to 58 did not expect that result. Gigi Jackson, freshman stud who we're expecting to watch throughout the season, had 12 mm -hmm. points, eight rebounds. PJ Hall still working his way back for Clemson, but came off the bench, had 22 minutes. Good to see that. Toledo beats UAB 93 85, notable mid major matchup. Uh, a, a little uh, intra Michigan matchup. Michigan mm -hmm. takes on Eastern Michigan. Only wins 88-83. Part of that is because Imani Bates transferred from Memphis up to Eastern Michigan, scores a career high 30 points. His previous high was 17. Pretty nuts there. But also on the other side, Hunter Dickinson had 31. Love to see that in college with two guys scoring 30 in the same game. It's great for the sport. And then Texas Southern knocks off Arizona State 67-66, also part of that Pac-12 SWAC legacy series that's been going on. SWAC's won a couple games there, and so mm -hmm. interesting for the Pac-12. Now, Andy, that's a little runaround. Let's go where you want to go. We got Villanova and Oregon falling on Friday and Tennessee yesterday afternoon on Sunday. Yeah, I think we got to start talking, start by talking about Tennessee. Uh, you can kind of mention the Pac-12 SWAC thing uh, and Colorado lost. They lost to Grambling State two days before they played Tennessee, the number 11 ranked team in the country, a Tennessee team that beat Gonzaga. Yes, it was an exhibition game, but they beat Gonzaga by 19 points, outscored them by 23 points in the second half. Rick Barnes's team was poised to be a potential top 10, top five team in the NCAA. I would have, I probably would have had them top seven, eight, somewhere in there going into this game. There's no, I would have thought that they had a real potential to be a top five team by the end of the year. Maybe they still do, but woof, things did not look good against the Buffs. This is not a bad Buffs team. Yes, they suffered that loss to Grambling, but I think Tad Boyle has done a pretty good job with this program. They've Never had like super high rated recruits, but they have continually kind of overperformed the expectations. I think Boyle is a very good coach, but 
this game was really, really rough for Tennessee. It was less about Colorado looking good and more about Tennessee. I just completely agree. Yeah, they just didn't look good. They just did not look good. Uh, after the game, uh, Rick Barnes was not happy. His conversations with media were pretty tense. He mentioned that Zakai Ziegler is going to be benched going forward. You don't you don't see coaches be that very specific well, about yeah, stuff like that very often. Uh, Ziegler did not have a good game. It was a rough one. This was a rough one. This was not the Tennessee team that we saw early in the year. This is not the Tennessee team that we saw in that Gonzaga scrimmage. Uh, Santiago Vescovi had a really Really yeah. rough night. I mean, we're talking about a preseason first team all WCC guy, two for 13 from the floor against Colorado, two for 13. He has 11 points. He struggled in their first game against Tennessee Tech. He needs to be better. We talk about Zakai Ziegler, but Vescovy needs to be better too. The guard play since the season started has not been good for Tennessee. Uh, this Colorado team just Looked really good. Tristan Da Silva had 14 in 20 minutes uh, for the team. KJ Simpson had 23 off the bench for Colorado. They have a, a relatively deep team for, for Tad Boyle's standards, and they just came out and just the whole second half, they could so easily get to the rim and just kept kept penetrating and kept getting to the basket and got easy finishes, and Tennessee was just cooked. And It's going to be interesting to see how they respond from this. Yeah, they're going to have to be better. It was weird. Uh, Tad Boyle used like a different starting lineup in this mm -hmm. game and uh, some interesting stuff there. But uh, honestly, Andy, my biggest takeaway from, from this, and, and you said it off the start of that game, grambling would kill Gonzaga. I think that's our biggest takeaway. <laughs> that's got to be it, right? Transitive property. Yeah. Transitive property. Um, so let's just go ahead and crown grambling our national champions and move on. Done. In all seriousness, uh, where I want to go next is Villanova because uh, so Villanova loses to Temple 68 64 on Friday night. And we discussed Villanova in our upset watch last Monday our, on our inaugural show. We just mm -hmm. had the wrong game. We said right. it might be LaSalle on opening day, but it, it ended the week with Villanova getting upset. And here's what I want to say to Villanova fans is patience, right? Like these things are going to happen in a season where you've got a brand new coach taking over for a legend where you've got your presumptive best player in Justin Moore on the shelf, where your freshman stud who you're expecting to rely on in a lot of ways, Cam Whitmore is also on out of commission currently. And so it's like, this is going to happen. It, like, again, we said it earlier, it's college basketball where you're playing 30 plus games and a team hasn't been undefeated in literally decades. So just, Pump the brakes. Let's be okay. Uh, a curious stat that stood out to me in this game is Villanova only attempted seven threes. Like Jay Wright is somewhere turning over in his seat, not his grave because he's not dead in any way. But I, I cannot imagine a Jay Wright team only mm -hmm. taking seven threes. Now, they attempted 20 in their first game. So I don't, I'm not saying this is going to be a staple of Kyle Neptune's mm -hmm. tenure at Villanova. But uh, man, that was very interesting to me. Now, Villanova probably still should have won this game. Yeah. They got a three to one, one of the few threes they actually made um, gave them a lead at 64, 62 with just under a minute to play. But then Temple goes on a six Oh run in that final minute to win all six of them are on free throws of those points. And uh, Villanova just can't pull it out in the end. But again, better days are going to be ahead for Villanova. This is just a one-off, but again, it's going to happen this season. Just stay patient, Villanova fans. I believe conclusively that better days are ahead for Villanova. I believe the same for Tennessee. I don't know if I can say the same for our final update or upset here on this list, uh, Oregon and UC Irvine. Oh my goodness. Dana Altman's ducks looked flat out awful from start to finish in this game. Hey, they led for seven seconds, Andy. <laughs> led for seven, seven seconds. seconds. Oh, they, got it. they were down by as many as 27 points to UC Irvine out of the Big West. Look, UC Irvine is a fine team. They are not, you know, it's not the equivalent of losing to like a Ken Palm 350 team or anything like that. They're 148th coming into the game. They're an okay team, but Oregon was ranked. They're I think they were 21st in the rankings. They were 28th in Ken Palm coming into this game. They dropped all the way to 45 after the loss. This was a, a really horrific performance from Dane Altman's team, quite frankly. They just... 
you know, we knew that it might take some time for some of the pieces to come together, but this is a team that returns Will Richardson, who is an all Pac-12 performer, fifth year senior, a guy who's been a, a staple of the program for a half decade. This is a team that returns Qu- Quincy Guerrier, who had 24, uh, 24 minutes, zero points. Didn't even score in 24 minutes of action for their kind of stretch four. They they return Nefali Dante. He had an okay game here, but like they return a lot of talent. They add some experienced talent via the transfer portal. This is not a team that was expected to come in and struggle right away. You know that there's always going to be, you know, finding ways to put the pieces together, but this this can't happen. This kind of game is just, it's a really, really huge black mark on this program for right now. Obviously, you know, things may may tick up, may come back around. Uh, but for the Pac-12, like Colorado picked up a nice win, but things aren't looking great in the Pac-12 right now. Arizona State's loss to Texas Southern. We kind of covered that already. Uh, and now we have a, this loss for Oregon. Like it's, things are a little bit rough. So it's going to be interesting to see if Oregon can kind of rebound, rebound from this. But this was a, a really, really ugly game for the Ducks. Uh, no worries for the Pac-12. Cal is awesome and they're going to win the, the conference. So <laughs> There you go. It's all going to come down to Cal. That must be it. <laughs> All right, folks, we're going to come back in the third and final segment. We're going to talk about the Gavit games and the Big East and the Big Ten and what some of those matchups might look like. Before we do that, though, this episode is brought to you by Nissan. This week's thrilling moment in college basketball is brought to you by Nissan. The thrilling designs behind the new lineup from Nissan are intended to empower drivers and vehicles as capable as the driver themselves. When I think of unbelievable abilities on the court, For this week's thrilling moment, it's got to be the Champions Classic. It's coming up on Tuesday night. It's going to be such a such a fun event Four phenomenal teams playing in this event. Really, really worth checking out for everybody who's a fan of college basketball. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all new Frontier Armada or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. All right, segment three here, Locked on College ba- college Basketball Podcast. Isaac, we got eight games between the Big East and the Big Ten scheduled for this week as part of the Gavit Games. However, there are 11 teams in the Big East, and there are 14 teams in the Big Ten. So why do we only have eight games? You tell me, Andy. I have no idea. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it'd be great to see – it's it's there's there every single team is good like there's no reason to not have every single one of these teams playing like we have some great matchups coming up don't get me wrong i'm not going to complain about getting a chance to see like marquette at purdue that's an awesome game that we get on tuesday indiana at xavier incredible game that's going to happen on friday but why is creighton not playing in a game here like why do we not see creighton or providence or ohio state or wisconsin like these are programs that should be able to participate in this event we talked at length last week about how college coaches aren't very willing to put themselves in positions to lose tough games early in the season. Uh, This seems like it could potentially be something that could is contributing to that. Why we're seeing some of these teams avoid playing some of these high profile matchups, but man, man, is it good for the sport to get to see Indiana and Xavier on a Friday night? Yes, absolutely. Like I, I love quite frankly, like the, the MTEs, the multi-team events at, at, Neutral mm-hmm. sites are great and they're a f- wonderful part of like this, mm-hmm. this late November, early December part of the season. But I particularly love these conference clashes things yeah. like that we'll have, you know, we get SEC and Big 12 usually like into January. Uh, early December, we'll have ACC Big 10 matchup. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember which year this is. They, they literally switch every year which conference gets mentioned first. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but, but this as well, the, the Big East and Big Ten, um, mm-hmm. for me, it's for two reasons. Number one, not playing just crud teams, right, right. Like, as we've talked so much about. And then number two, on-campus sites. The yeah. games are better when they are on-campus sites. It's better student environment. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not stale. It's, it's lively. Yeah. And it's just better for the brand of college basketball. And so I love – that uh, coaches are forced to do this because as you mm-hmm. said, and as you said, we talked about last week, mm-hmm. they're going to do what's in their best interest. It's right. why we so often talk about, I like to say, we need a grand poobah <laughs> of college basketball. We need a, right. a czar, a king, whatever you want to mm-hmm. call this person. Mm-hmm. They need um, to, we, we need people looking out for the interest of their own teams, but mm-hmm. we need someone looking out for the interest of the entity of college basketball. Right. Whether that is an NCAA affiliated person or not, mm-hmm. doesn't mm-hmm. really matter to me because whatever NCAA, but um, 
we need someone to help regulate these type of optics things. And you mm -hmm. know, like it, it, the TV people want that too. They want these bigger yeah. matches. So let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. so, so let's run quickly. Just I'll, I'll run down the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, Monday, Butler at Penn State. DePaul at Minnesota. Woof, whatever. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, Marquette at Purdue. Northwestern at Georgetown. Wednesday, one game. Iowa at Seton Hall, Thursday, one game, Nebraska at St. John's, and then Friday, the pinnacle, as you already talked about, Indiana and Xavier, and then Villanova at Michigan State, um, who we both of whom we've already talked about mm -hmm. on this show today. And so in, in terms of who's left out, let's look at that. Big East, three teams left out. We have Creighton, who was a top 10 team, was last season's fourth place team in the Big East. Providence, last season's regular season champs. UConn, last season's third place team. So three of last year's top four regular season Big East teams not playing in this event. Makes zero sense. No uh, sense at all. Big 10, you've got six teams left out, as Andy talked about. Only eight of the 14 are playing. So we leave out Rutgers. Okay, fine. <laughs> Illinois. Maryland, Michigan, Ohio State, and Wisconsin are not playing. You're doing yourself – like, this series is great. Mm -hmm. the, the the way it's being employed here is – like, could, can we just hop in and take charge of this and, right. and sample it, Andy, and, and get some – like, even just, like, take a peek at these – three Big East teams, six Big Ten teams not playing. Let's mm -hmm. smash some of them up and see what, what fun matchups we could find. Yeah, I, that, absolutely. You're telling me that we can't put Creighton and Michigan on Wednesday? Like, you can't tell me we can't put Hunter Dickinson versus Ryan Kalkbrenner, like that kind of matchup? It's 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 shame that we're not going to able to get matchups like that. We can't get Providence and Maryland, kind of two of the farther East teams. We can't get them to play each other like – I feel like this is the kind of thing that we could put some matchups together here with the teams that aren't in it. And like, it's great that they're doing this big East, big 10 phenomenal Absolutely. basketball conferences. Almost any matchups that you put together are going to be fun or enticing in some capacity, but just looking at the teams that didn't even get a chance to be in this event or chose not to be in this event or whatever capacity, they're not participating in it. And we don't get to see UConn and Ohio state or Creighton, Michigan, or, you know, pick any combination that you want to pick there because there's just so many fun opportunities to see basketball that we're unfortunately not going to see this year. Absolutely. And it, the, here's the good news. In the ACC Big Ten Challenge, Big Ten ACC Challenge, mm -hmm. in a couple weeks, the, so with the ACC having 15 and the Big Ten having 14, we're going to see all of them except one ACC team. I believe it's NC State is the team out this year. And so that is thankful. But but even looking at this schedule, like it doesn't make sense. Why, why not at the very least do 10 and have two games a night? Like yeah. why on Wednesday and Thursday are we leaving team? Like if anything, it should be Monday where we only have one game. Again, let's mm -hmm. not try to compete with Monday night football. That, Absolutely. Uh, but – Let's have two games a night. It just, I don't get it. I, I, somebody needs to tell me why we can't make this better. Well, we do have a lot of fun games coming up this week. Even if we don't have as many as we would like, we're starting to finally start to see the, some of the more fun right. games in the college basketball schedule. Uh, we're going to have so much more content coming your guys' way this week. More fun previews, reviews of big games. Of course, the Champions Classic coming on as well here on the Locked On College Basketball podcast. I want to thank all of you who have made Locked On College Basketball your first listen of the day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Isaac, way more fun coming ahead this week. Uh, I'm excited for you guys all to check it out. 